Good morning, Gillian. We're so glad you're here to worship the Lord with us today. Come on, let's give Jesus the highest praise we have. Let's lift him high. He's so worthy of it. We're going to sing this morning, then we're going to set our eyes on Jesus. We're going to look to the sun today. Come on, sing it out with us. Sing salvation. Salvation, tearing through the dead of night. See the kingdom burst into color at the We sing freedom, shaking up the atmosphere. As our shadows fade today, as our shadows fade into nothing, as a day appears. Beyond the skies above, beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us. The everlasting one, Jesus our God. Every voice we lift this up when we look to the sun. Set our eyes on our Savior. See the image of love. See His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. You see creation. Creation. Wait. See the hope of heaven, see the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. Oh, not forever, lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless life. You sing this out beyond the sky, beyond the skies of love. Love reaching out for us, He is the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the sea.
I'm so glad you're here today. How many of you have something that you got at Christmas on today? All right, you don't have to name what it is because it might be undies, so don't tell us. But uh, Merry Christmas, and we're right between Christmas and the New Year's, and uh, there's something I want to share with you uh, this morning right before we get started. That's the newest member of our church. Come on up here. And uh, this... I'm pleased to announce is Benjamin James Lewis. Look at that hair, would you? And uh, he got the blow dry this morning. And uh, he's, he's just a miracle of God. 
and uh, we are so pleased with him. So far, he's a, he's a great baby, and we praise God for him. Hopefully, uh, you families that are able, we would love to do this every week. Come on. Amen, <laughs> church? So, young families, let's get after it. Some of you middle-aged ones, you think, you know, time has passed. Come on, get with it. And uh, your quiver's not full yet, and we'd love, we'd love to dedicate your children. But at, when I, I ask young families to bring their children up here uh, because we, I want to pray for them. And, and the prayer is very similar because the main thing we want our children to do is to come to know God as their Savior. Amen? And, and so we pray for that, and we want them to, to do that as early as possible and because if they know God, the, the potential in their life is, is unlimited. Can I get an amen to that? So, so would, you, would you join with me in prayer? This is our uh, Cindy and I's second grandson, and we are so blessed. Amen? And uh, they are feeling, they lost their first child. And uh, so they have one in heaven that they are looking forward to meet, just not this week. So... Uh, let's pray for this one. Raise your hands up to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you uh, for blessing Sean and Rachel with Benjamin James. And Lord, we know he's a gift from you. And we pray, Lord, that you would uh, do a work in his heart and that he would come to know you as his God and Savior early in life. Lord, that you would protect him, make him a mighty warrior for you, and make a difference for eternity in other people's lives, we pray in Jesus' holy name. If you pray with me, church, say amen. 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 Thanks for bringing them up here, you guys. Good job. Wow. And uh, we, have, we have another couple might be up next week. Are the Garcias upstairs? You guys upstairs and all that. She, she, I talked to her last week, and she said, I want it to be any day. So uh, John and Abby, they're, they're wanting delivery as soon as possible, so pray for them. Uh, open your worship guide. We're going to start a new series today because we want to get the year started right. And because of that, uh, we're going to begin on January 7th, which is a, a week from today. We're going to begin 21 days of prayer and, and fasting. But before that takes place this Wednesday, we're going to start the year with our first First Wednesday service, and because we're going to follow that up with 21 days of prayer and fasting, we figured we'd turn it into a party. And, and so we're going to have a message, the Lord's Supper, uh, special music, and then go in the lobby for some pizza and, and, and Cokes, because why? Because then right after that, you know, we're, we're going to do 21 days of prayer and fasting, so it's a, it's a little break before that prayer and fasting, so make it a priority in your life. And that really what this series is about and why we're starting the year with a series on first because priorities in our life and in our time, they matter. The things that we put in order of priority in our life, where things fit in our life, if you will, determines whether or not we will be successful in them. I know that all of us are time conscious, especially you're time conscious on Sunday when I'm about halfway through my notes and you're like, man, he's, we're going to be here another 40 minutes. And, and we're looking at our watches. You're time conscious about being in here. Uh, and, and most everybody, we wear watches or we look at our phones a lot because we're, we're time conscious today. But really, this series is about being time conscious for eternity, for eternity. Because the Bible talks about time a lot and the order of our life and the things that we put in order according to the time in our life is important. That's what it says in your introduction. The order of our life, the order of things in our life is important. So when we look at time and we start legislating our life, we need to think about the time in our life, not just where it is now, but with the end in mind, just this week, uh, in fact, just it was yesterday afternoon, I'm driving in the car with my wife and one of the kids. We just live in such an amazing day. The kid, one of the, one of the girls, you know, FaceTimed her. We're driving down the expressway and on her phone, she's talking and looking at a video of our daughter and Benjamin. 
And she's in the passenger seat doing that, and, and they're talking. She, oh, he looks so cute, and doing all that kind of stuff. She gets done with that FaceTime call, which, did you ever think that would be possible? I mean, that is amazing if you think about it. Can I get an amen right there? And, and those of you that do it while you're driving, come on now. Okay, the passenger can, but you can't. There's sermon number one right there. I'm done. She gets done, and she hangs it up, and she goes, our babies have babies. Our babies have babies. And what she's saying, time has gone fast, but if you look at our life, we, we have moments where we have conversations. She goes, you know, the time we have left is way shorter than the time that we've already lived. It is. Because I don't plan on living to be 120. So I'm not at halftime. I'm past halftime. Okay? And when you think about it in those terms, some of you are like, I'm glad I came to church today. <laughs> it causes you to start thinking about what's important. And what is that? What matters for eternity. Because eternity is not going to have a limited time frame. In fact, that's why it's called eternity. It's outside the frame of time. Can I get an amen to that? And that's good news. And so time is a measurement. And we should measure less about, oh, what I'm doing right now with my time, and more, how much time do I have left? In fact, the Bible encourages us to measure our life, to number it, and to be conscious about how much time we have. If you go to the book of Job, and if you want to be encouraged, just read the book of Job. Here's what he says. He says, my days pass more swiftly than a weaver's shuttle. They come to an end without hope. And so I think Job was talking about his days. He was thinking and pondering about how life is going quickly by. And he's like, man, life has gone by like, and he couldn't say a race car because they weren't created yet. He's like, what's fast? And he's like, I know. I've watched my wife work that weaver's beam, and that wooden thing she throws, between, it just goes and goes and goes. And what the point that Job is saying, a weaver's beam had all these strands of, of, of thread and, and yarn, we would call it, all hundreds of them. And then it would switch up and down and they would throw that back and forth to create it. All these details of life, all these millions of parts of life, God is orchestrating and then the rug is finished. And what do they do? They take a piece of metal and they snip it at the end and it's over. And that's what life is like. You got all these details and all this stuff going on, and it's boom, 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 zoom, zoom, zoom. Then what happens? Boom! It's over. Snipping that thread. That's why that verse says, You're like, Oh, that's why Job said that. Aren't you glad you came to church today? You're like, Boy, I was looking for encouragement. I just got it right there. Life is over, just like snipping the thread. Yes, it is. But that's why he said in chapter 9, My days fly faster than a runner, they flee without seeing any good. And it's true. Let me tell you, I'm not saying anything you don't know already here, but another year is coming to a close. Here it is, another year. And it goes quickly. And at the end of next year, which is going to be here like a fast runner, it's going to be the end of another decade. And, and year passes into year, decade into decade, and then all of a sudden, snip, and it's over. And that's why Job said, think about it. Think about it. And in fact, David in the Psalms in chapter 39, he wrote, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me, and I want you to say this with me, remind me that my days are, say this with me, church, numbered. Say it out loud. My days are numbered. My days are numbered. That's not a bad thing. It's not like, oh, that's depressing. No. How fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you, God. At best, each of us is but a breath. Poof. And then he says, think about this. Think about it. 
Because I think we get so enamored with all the different threads, we forget that God is at work. And if we join him in that work, our life will be meaningful and purposeful. We will fulfill our potential. Life will be a blessing. But sometimes we end up spinning our life worrying about the threads and how it's all going to work out. And we forget to live it while it's going on. We make all these plans. I say, well, well, is there anything wrong with plans? No. But you, you know what happens while you're making plans? Life. Life is what happens. And that's what the psalmist is saying. James says this in the New Testament too. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will travel. He's making plans. Nothing wrong with that. To such and such city, we'll spend a year there, do business, make a profit. And then the Lord says, you don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like smoke that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Life is like a vapor. It's real, but compared to eternity, it's very brief. Now, I am not telling you this to create a sense of panic in you today. What I want to create and what the series is at the start of a new year is to create in all of us a sense, listen to this, of urgency. Of urgency. Not to allow another year just to slip past without making meaningful spiritual change and strides in our life. I want us to end the next year going, thank God for 2019. God did this amazing work in my life. I got to believe there's people in this room that you'd say, man, 2018, what really happened? Well, it's over. I'm hoping better for 2019. Good. And that's why in this series, we want to get started right first. Because why? Life is brief. Life is brief. The writer of Hebrews says, and just as is it appointed for people to die once and after this judgment. Now, once again, aren't you glad you came to church today? Years ago, we did a series. And the series was based on the idea that what would your life look like if you knew you had 30 days to live? What would it look like? And they say, what it would look like, how differently we would live it if we knew for a fact that we only had 30 days to live. That's what the whole series was based on. Probably one of the more impactful series I've preached in my life. Because it got us all thinking, you know what, I would live differently if I knew my days were, are numbered. Well, guess what? We just read the verses, our days are numbered. They are numbered. They are numbered. But let me share this with you. And this is very important. It's right there in your notes because we're going to read this statement and then right after that, the theme verse for this whole series. Whatever we have a lot of, we tend to squander away. So if we think we have a lot of time, we don't make use of it. If we have a lot of money, yeah, buy this, buy that, buy that, you know, whatever. If we have good health, I don't need to see the doctor. Whatever we have a lot of, we tend to squander but, on the other hand, we're more conscious when we think there is little. Isn't that true? So when we look accurately from the biblical viewpoint of our life, the verses that we've already read, and I haven't told you anything you don't already know. We all know life is brief. We all know it goes faster than we realize. So since that's true, we should be more conscious of it because we don't have a lot of time. Now, there's some people that sit here, well, I'm not old like you, Pastor. I'm in my 20s. Well, let me break it to you this way. 20 was yesterday for me. You say, oh, no, it was. It was over 30 years ago for you. <laughs> That's what I said. It was yesterday. Because it feels like yesterday. Yeah. And in fact, if I'm listening to the right song on the radio, I get taken right back there just like that. <laughs> staying alive, staying alive, ah, ah, right? And I'm there. 
And me and John Travolta and I got my white shirt on, on uh, you know, unbuttoned down to my navel, gold chains, and I'm grooving. You're like, that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing just to keep you focused here. Here's the theme verse for the whole series. Actually, it's a psalm, but David didn't write this. Moses wrote it. I think this is important because Moses, he tried to make things happen too fast in his life. And then God put him on the backside of the desert for 40 long years, tending sheep. And Moses, he, he just surrendered to it. He said, this is my life now. And then God came to him one day in the form of a burning bush. You know that story. And what did Moses do? He had to step aside from his daily responsibilities. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step aside and go see this thing. And really, that's what I want us to do at the beginning of this year. I want us to step aside. I still want you to go to work and all that, but mentally and emotionally and spiritually, I want you to step aside and, and, and focus the first month. We're not going to do small groups. We're not going to do any evangelism. We're not... Our plan for the first part of the year is to focus on God and give him the first and see what he says to us. And let him arrange the rest of the year. Let him speak to us so that he can bless the rest of the year. We're going to give him a tithe of our time. Go, Lord, January belongs to you. Now bless the rest. Because there's people, oh, I, I, want, I want to do my small groups and say, in January. Why are we taking such a long break? To put God first. So we're going to have prayer meetings the first Monday, the, sev uh, uh, the 7th, the 14th, the 21st, a special night of prayer. Come out and give God that time and let him speak to your soul. Do some prayer and fasting. We're going to, if you are on remind, we're going to give you a verse and something to pray about every single day we're going to give you instructions on how to fast and how to pray. Every single day, it'll come right to your phone. Give God the first and see if he can't bless the rest. Amen? And so here's what Moses writes, the one who stepped aside and God totally changed his life in one conversation. One conversation. He sent him to go do something that we still write books about today. To go be the one to deliver his people out of slavery in Egypt. Miraculously. It, nothing's ever been done before or since. And here's what Moses writes in Psalm. And this is our theme verse. He says, teach us, ready church? Teach us to number our days. Let's say that again. Teach us to number our days. Let's say it out loud again. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. So the first thing Moses says in the psalm, Lord, teach me to recognize how much time I have left. That's what he's talking about. Teach me to be cognizant of it. Teach me to live like my days are numbered. So I can take more advantage of them instead of squandering them away. Teach me. And he says, then I can develop wisdom in my heart. I haven't said anything so far. I'm 16 minutes and 31 seconds into the message. I haven't said one thing that you were like, oh, I never knew that. Everything I've said, you already know. We already know. I haven't said anything that anybody in this room has. Oh, I didn't know life was limited. I didn't know I was going to die one day. You, you knew that. But what's wisdom? Wisdom is not knowledge. We don't need more knowledge. What we need is more wisdom. What's wisdom? Wisdom is the proper application of knowledge. Taking that knowledge that life is limited and then using it to bring glory and honor to the Lord, using it to grow spiritually as his children. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is taking that knowledge and applying it to our life. Applying it to our life. If, if we were to sit here and I handed out a sheet of paper and said, okay, put, put your top five values, what you think are important in life, put those things down. And you'd have no trouble writing that list of your values. 
and my values. And then if we were then to go and look at our checkbooks or our bank statements or our time allocation, would those things, where our money goes, where our time goes, where our thought life, would they line up with our values or would they be misspent on things that really aren't in the top five? Even though they are our values, I venture to say most of our time is spent on things that are not in the top five. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is understanding that these things are most valuable and putting our time and thoughts and resources into what is most valuable. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. So why don't we preach this at the beginning of the year? <laughs> because we take assessment at the end of a year, beginning of a new one. We, it, it, it's natural. It's the, it's, it's the end of something and the beginning of something else on a, on a calendar, on a time, on a larger clock. And it's okay. In fact, I, I'm a big fan of it. I'm a big fan of it. And why? Because, if you look at your notes, we need to put first things first because it affects the rest. It determines, it influences the rest. So if we put God first in our lives in January, it will influence and determine how 2019 goes. What we do first in our time, what we do first in our day, what we do first in our week, that influences and determines the rest of it. What we do first. And that's what we've, co- we've called the series first. It's our time, it's our money, and our thoughts. We don't want, not only want to make those valuable things first because it affects the rest, but secondly, we want to give focus and energy to the things that really matter. What lasts? So what do you mean what lasts? Okay, let's put a, let's put a, a calendar time frame on it. How about 100 years? So I won't be here in 100 years. Right. And just because I'm not going to be here in 100 years doesn't mean I can't do something today that doesn't affect something 100 years from now. Can I get an amen to that? That's the way to live with a longer time frame. We need to live and do things and invest in things that will affect people's lives far longer than we are physically here on this earth. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. And you say, well, when are we going to do it? We're going to do it now with a sense of urgency. These are the three things that we're going to cover in this series. To put first things first because it affects the rest. It influences and determines how successful we are. We're going to learn to give focus and energy to the things that really matter, and we're going to learn how to do it now with urgency. So let's lengthen these a little bit, what to do first. And like I said, I'm I'm a fan of resolutions. I'm going to make some this year. I'm going to make some physical uh, resolutions. Uh, We we started a little early. We said we are not going to load up on the weight and from Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but typically it's an eating bin from Thanksgiving all the way through the new year. And my wife and I said, no, we've actually, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we actually lost a couple pounds, so God is real. (laughs) That's proof right there. So God is real. Resolutions matter, but we all make resolutions, and you already see it on TV. They're doing all the eating plans or advertising, I mean, constantly, incessantly. Because what? They know it's the end of a year and the beginning of a new year, and that people resolve to change things. But we also know that all those gym memberships typically never make it out of uh, January. We know that. You would think, people paying good money like that, why can't they make it past January? Well, they resolved, but they didn't have any power behind their resolve. Okay? Well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And we make those resolutions, but we also need the power to do them. Can I get an amen? And so how do I make resolutions to get the power... See, that's where the spiritual life comes in. The reason most people never follow up on the resolutions is because they have no power to implement what they're resolving to do. They know they need to do this right thing. They know it's good for them, but they can't find it. Why? Because they're detached from the spiritual side of life. Yeah. So look at this. Number one, we are going to turn win into now. This is what we're going to do in this series. Turn win into 
now. I love that word now, don't you? Because when we resolve to, let's say, lose a couple pounds, we look in our pantry and our refrigerator and we say, yeah, I need to lose a few pounds, but I'm not going to waste what's in there. I paid good money for that. So I'm going to do that after I eat all this bad stuff, then I'll do that. And it's amazing how we never get to then. Well, I'm preaching like 100% better and you are responding right there because you know that's true. So then never becomes now. Then always, starts, always stays then. So then's going to become now. How does that happen? Here's what Paul said 2,000 years ago. 2 Corinthians 6, for he says, I heard you in an acceptable time, and I helped you in the day of salvation. Look, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Let me just stick my neck out here. I already believe in 2018 that God has spoken to each and every one of you. I already believe that. Why? Because God loves you and he cares for you and he speaks to you all the time. And I know at least once you've heard him. But did it change anything? Only if then becomes now. That's what this verse is saying. It's never going to happen until it becomes now. Never going to happen. See, we make the mistake of, saying, of thinking that life is about this physical self with a little spirit added to it. And that's wrong. Here's what life is. We are forever spiritual beings. Who you are, your soul is going to live forever. And it's temporarily housed in this physical body. And when we start looking like that, now becomes more of a possibility. Why? That's the spiritual side of things. This body is wasting away, but the spirit lives forever. So when we become more spiritually minded, it gives us the power to say, oh, I'm doing that today. I'm doing that now. I'm doing that now. God has already spoken to you, and nothing changed. Why? Because you never let then become now. He spoke to you and said, yeah, I ought to do that. I'm going to do that. I'll make it now. Surrender to the Spirit. Some of you need to this year, you need to surrender to reading the Bible in a year. Say, I can't read that much. If you get on our one-year Bible reading plan, it's, it's 10, 15 minutes a day. You will read the Bible through this next year. And if you combine that with praying and talking to God about what you just read, I guarantee you 2019 will be an unbelievable year of spiritual things in your life. If we put Him first... Plug in to God. First 15 minutes of the day. Let him speak to you, and you speak to him. Open your heart to him. And in 15 minutes a day, it will change your year. It will change, because why? We are spiritual beings temporarily living in a physical house. Okay? Secondly, so turn when and now. The second thing we're going to do, we're going to turn intentions into actions. Most of us know what, like I said, this isn't a series about knowledge. This is a series about wisdom, about taking that, what we already know, and putting it into action. James 4, 17 says, it is a sin for the person who knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. A lot of people think my job as a pastor is to prepare really great messages and to pray for people and visit the sick. And then that's it. And actually, that's not quite it. My job as a pastor is to lead you spiritually. And in November, I'm sorry, in October, November, and December, I led you and said, listen, we got to focus on our missions projects that are going to happen in the spring. And we got to start taking offerings because we're going to feed these kids. And we, 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 I led you in, in several outreach projects that are going to impact eternity. And you followed, and you gave, and you invested. And now, 
in the month of January, I'm not going to lead you to go do a project. I'm not going to lead you to go do evangelism. We're not going to talk about missions. We're going to talk about putting God first. And we're going to put it into action. We're going to give you vision. Why? Because I believe if every person here taps into the God of the universe, he will show us what he wants to do. He will do a mighty work that we can't chart in a church service. He'll do amazing things in all our lives. Why? He's the God of the universe. So we're going to do 21 days to put God first because we want to get vision from him. And so how do I turn intentions into action so that I don't sin and know what to do and don't do it? First of all, we need to focus on power. Focus on power. We need to tap into the spiritual power of God. First Peter writes it this way, and we're going to read First Peter, the fourth chapter, for all these points. He says, now the end, Peter writes, the end of all things is near. Did you hear that, church? Peter wrote 2,000 years ago, the end of all things is near. You say, oh, man, Peter got that wrong. Not if you look at the world through heaven's time clock, where 1,000 years is as a day. It's just been two days. And heaven's time clock, two days. And he, Peter said, the end is near. And let me tell you, I really believe that. In fact, the Bible says that there's all these prophecies that have to come true before the return of Christ. There are no prophecies left that need to be fulfilled. They've all been fulfilled. The time of the return of Christ is near. You say, well, what if it doesn't happen in the next year? Well, let me tell you something. Death is near for all of us already. Aren't you glad he came to church? <laughs> the time is near. Can I get an amen? It already is. Okay, whether we experience the return of Christ or not, the time is near, and it gets nearer every day. So Peter saying that end of all things is near is true. Therefore, be serious. The word there means clear-minded and disciplined for prayer. Peter actually gives us Actually, the schedule we're going to keep. He says, since the end is near, let's pray first. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to seek God first in January with 21 days of prayer and fasting. I'm going to lead you in that. You say, I, I can't do this. Yes, you can. It's just a matter of being empowered to do it. Let me tell you, we'll do anything that we're desperate for. And that's the second thing. Not only focus on power but we need to be desperate for God to show up. I'm desperate for God to show up in 2019. I am, I'll just tell you. I'm desperate for it. I, I have this sense of urgency in my spirit that I haven't felt in decades. And I truly believe that this year, if we will put God first, he will do things to change the future of our church that we can't even imagine, but we have to be desperate for them. Because if we just, oh, same old, same old, man, God doesn't show up with people looking at their spiritual life, ah, it's just the same thing. Eh, I'll get to church if I can. Eh, 21 days of prayer and fast, I don't do that. Man, if you had Broadway tickets, you'd show up. Why? Well, I bought the tickets, I'm showing up, of course. And if U of M was in a bowl game, you'd be watching it. Oh, they were in a bowl game. I mean, one that mattered. Oops. Yeah, like the playoff ones? Man, we'd put it on our calendar. We'd invite friends over. We'd make it a priority. Yeah, why? Desperate to see our team win? Yeah. So we need to be desperate to show up. So we're going to begin 2019 Asking God to give us revival. Asking God to renew our spirit. Asking God to give us vision that is beyond what we've ever thought possible. Vision outside. If, if our plans for this year are what we can do, why do we need God? How about our plans for this year that only happen if God shows up huge? How about live that life? Yeah. That's, that's worth praying about. But praying... Oh, God, I'd 
I'd like to be able to walk on a treadmill. Oh, come on. You can't walk on a treadmill? Of course you can. Just need a little willpower. Let's shoot for something bigger. Shoot for something bigger. So we're going to focus on power and ask God to bring revival and renewal to our hearts. Secondly, focus on people. Peter goes on to say, above all, maintain an intense, that's a deep love for each other. Since love covers a multitude of sins, be hospitable to one another without complaining. Well, that just means we're going to have to quit talking half the time. Oh, I just went from preaching to meddling right there, didn't I? Okay, that's right. That means most of what comes out of this mouth, my mouth, I'm not talking about yours, just mine, probably not, not a, to come out. Because why? It's just a complaint in some form. Yeah. He says, quit complaining and instead love each other. Show a deep love to one another. Let me tell you what the backbone of our church is, small groups. You can come on Sunday, enjoy the music. If you don't enjoy our music, I'm like, what? Have you heard music in other churches? We have phenomenal music. Can I get an amen? amen? They did such a good job over Christmas. I mean, it just blessed my soul. I listen to our music in the car because it's better than what's on the radio. Yeah. Let me tell you something funny. You know, since we do all our music live, we can take popular Christian songs and we can put the music on our website w- with our messages so that you can watch them. If, you're, if you miss a Sunday, you can watch it and get the music too. Well, if we played that music to a track, a soundtrack, we could not upload it to the Internet because it's copyright violation. So that's why we do all our music live so we can upload it and not violate copyright laws. Simple enough, right? Here's what happens a couple times a year. Their music is so like the original artists that when we upload it, YouTube goes, can't do it. You're copying the original artist. You're you're putting the original artist, and we have to do the computer talking back and forth. No, no, this was live. No, we don't believe it because the computer reads it and says, no, that sounds just like the original. Come on, give them an amen right there. Amen. They sound just like the originals. That's a lot of hard work and all that. So I think the preaching is okay, fair to Midland. Music is outstanding. Comfortable surroundings, great Dunkin' Donuts coffee, goodies in the lobby. I mean, what more do you want in church? Right? Not painful. Not painful. But let me tell you, if that's all you experience in Gilead... We will never become your family. God meant for you to be a part of a spiritual family. And that happens through small groups. When you make friendships and relationships, when you get involved in other people's lives here, and you start making friendships with brothers and sisters in Christ, that's when Gilead becomes your home. So we got a small group semester starting up right after 21 days of prayer and fasting. Some of you are probably thinking about whether you should host a small group and you need to come to the training for that. Some of you need to get in a small group. I I mean, you're going to hear it more and more. Why? Because you're an orphan if you're not in a small group. You're an attender, but you're not part of the family. God made you to connect with others, to be a blessing to others, and you can't do it on the outside. can't do it an hour a week. You have to get connected and make friends. And so he says, maintain an attitude of intense love for each other. Get in a small group. Focus on power. Focus on people. Third, focus on your purpose. Peter goes on to write in verse 10, same chapter. Based on the gift each one of us has received, use that gift to serve others as good managers of the varied grace of God. If anyone speaks, should be as one who speaks God's words. If I'm good, I, I think I'm gifted to speak. So he says, then get good at it. That's what that says. If I'm going to speak, then get good at it. And I study every week to try to make my speaking better. But if you're someone who serves, if you're a sweeper, if you're a greeter, 
If you're on the safety team, if you're on one of our dream teams here, he says what? He says, do it better. Do it under the Lord. It should be from the strength God provides so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belongs the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The sad thing is that 87% of the people sitting in church do not know what their spiritual gift is. So how are they going to plug in to using that gift to make a difference in other people's lives? Yeah, to first find out what it is. That's what Growth Track is about. And that's why we do it every single month for four straight weeks. So I took it. It didn't re- Listen, for you to receive the full benefit out of Growth Track, you need to come two or three times. Because it's only an hour. And there's so, such a voluminous amount of material. And if you haven't studied it at home, then you looked at it as just like Sunday school material, and it's probably just collecting dust underneath a bunch of other stuff that's unused in your home. I know exactly what my personality type is, and why I see things the way I see. I not only know mine, I know my wife's, so I can better understand her and why she looks at things so weird. Because she has a different personality type than me. Yeah. And I also know what my spiritual giftedness is. And I know what hers is. So that what? So that instead of looking at her and just saying, you're just trying to be difficult, honey. You just never agree with me, honey. No, she's wired differently. God made her differently than me. He gifted her differently. And when I understand what her giftedness is, And what mine is, it helps us to get along. Shocker. Because let me tell you what your spiritual gift is. It is like these glasses. Everything in your life you will view through that spiritual gift, whether you like it or not, that's the truth. It's a set of spiritual glasses that God has given you. If you're in relationship with God, you have a spiritual gift. And he gave you that gift to be a blessing to others. So jump in to growth track. Find out what your gift is so you can put it to use making a difference in other people's lives for eternity. Can I get an amen? And you can do that in four simple weeks. So we need to have power, focus on the power and get that from God. We need to focus on people and focus on our purpose. Now here's point number three. And you're going to fill in the blank, and then you're going to, man, I can't believe how fast it was today, and you're going to be so surprised. Here's point number three. Turn my whole heart towards Jesus. So turn when into how, when into now, intentions into actions, and number three, my whole heart toward Jesus. There was a man that came and asked Jesus a question. He said, hey, how can I be right with God? How can I be in and instead of Jesus to give him the answer, he said, how do you see it? He turned it back around on the guy and said, how do you see it? And the guy answers, well, I, I think I should you know, love God with all my heart, mind, and soul and, and love my brother just like it. And Jesus said, good job. In fact, here's how Jesus responded to him in Mark 12, 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered intelligently, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You're close. You almost got it. And no one dared to question him any longer because everybody else was like, oh man, he hit that one out of the park. And Jesus said, you're close. You're close. Since we're sitting in church today, I think I can say this with a little bit of confidence. I think many church people, people that are regular attenders in church, they have... A little bit of Jesus. I have all of them. I got a little bit of Jesus. Just enough to separate us from the crazy people in the world. A little bit of Jesus. What you have is like a flu shot of Jesus. See that right there in your notes? Flu shot? You're like, where's he going with the flu shot? He's going to tell everybody. CDC called him this week and said, Pastor, tell everybody to get their flu shot. Now, we got a little, it's, it's like a little flu shot of Jesus. I, I've talked to my doctor because, and, and our girls are both nurses, and so we, we've, ever since our kids were born, we've been getting them flu shots. We get them every year. I shake, you know, 
hundreds of people's hands every week. I haven't had the flu in, I can't tell you when. And, and I know that there's controversy about vaccinations and all that, but let me tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm a glowing vaccinated guy. All right? And uh, so let's just leave that aside. I asked my doctor one time, I said, what is a flu shot exactly? And he said, it's the flu, man. I said, you're shooting me with the flu? He goes, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, pastor, it's kind of like the flu without power. It's the flu without power, and it tricks your body into developing an immunity so that when the real thing comes, you got a fence. And I think there's a lot of Christians that got a flu shot Jesus. You got just enough to where you don't look like the people stumbling out of the bar. But you don't have the real thing. You don't have all of it. Don't have all of it. And man, it is my prayer that there would be somebody today and somebody in January that recognizes, ah, I don't have all, everything that's available in Jesus, but I'm going to receive it now. I gotta believe there's a good percentage of people that walked in this door today feeling guilty. The enemy has made you guilty and probably shame. And you couldn't lift your hands in worship today because you felt, man, if I do that, I'll just be a hypocrite. And here's the good news about our God. So I could I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't pray this morning because I've I've asked him forgiveness for that a thousand times. Well, let me, let me tell you the good news. He doesn't remember those thousand times. When you ask forgiveness from our Jesus, he separates it as far as the east is from the west. He puts it in the sea of his forgetfulness, and his mercies are new today. They're new today. So you can start over right now. That's the key word. You know you can start over because you know that about our God. The key word is now. The key word's now. You're going to do it now? It's, ah, you know what? I, I need to do that this week. You won't do it. Now is the acceptable time. Right now. Let's begin. Say, Jesus, I, don't, I just don't want a little bit of you. I want all of you. I want it all. And that means we got to let go of some things to grab hold of him. We can't have our hands full of all this nonsense. Say, okay, I'll hold you. No, let go of that stuff. And lift up those empty hands to Jesus and see what he can do with 2019. Amen? Let's put him First. First. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we're going to pray right now. Right before we pray, as the musicians come forward, there's probably some people in here who say, Man, I, I need to make Jesus my Savior. I, I've known him from afar. I believe that he exists, but he, he's, he doesn't live within me. I, I'm not really in relationship with him. It, it's this, I, I think he lives in this building. That's why I come to this building. And I want to make him real in my life and in my heart. I want to surrender completely to him today. If that's your prayer, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. And if you've never done that before, would you just be bold enough to slip your hand and say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. Upstairs or down, just slip your hand up. You don't have to wave it or do anything crazy. I'm not going to point at you or... I, I just want to pray for you. Just slip your hand up. Say, yes, yes. Awesome. Awesome. I see that upstairs. You don't have to keep them up. And if I don't see it, that's okay too. Because Jesus is lo looking at your heart. Let's say you're a believer. You, but Jesus has become like a flu shot to you, and you want all of them today. You want to draw close to him. You want to, to begin renewing your heart right now. Right now. 
and leave the guilt and the shame. Leave it with him. Cast your burden on him and start fresh right now. And get your heart ready for focusing on God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's your prayer, would you slip your hand up? Oh, hands all over. Yeah. Let's pray together. Father God, you see our hearts, you read our minds. But Lord, we are a family in you. And this year is just going to be the best we can do. And all the best we can do is, is horrible in sight of what you can do in, for us. Our best is unrighteousness to you. But Lord, we want to experience your best for us this year. And so Lord, we surrender our hearts. We surrender our minds and our thoughts. We surrender our time, our resources. We are going to put you first, starting now, so that you can bless the rest of this coming year. Lord, for some in this room, that means surrendering their life and asking forgiveness and asking you to become their Lord and Savior. For others, it, it's, it's a confession of the staleness of our relationship and asking you to renew it and to take it to new heights this year and to renew our hearts and enable us to fall in love with you all over again each and every day so you can bless what happens that day. Lord, we pray this in the name of a gracious, merciful God who will never stop loving us, who will never leave us or forsake us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' holy name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen and amen. Jesus, you are holy.